Back in 2006, Studio Dean made a Fate Stay Night adaptation complete with badly animated CGI dragons, uninspired action scenes, and character monologues that really didn't make much sense. Needless to say, it was less than stellar. If you've been keeping up to date with anime in recent years, you've probably heard about the anime studio Euphoribol, with their most noticeable works being the series of Karnyo Kyokai films and more recently the Fate franchise. With the high production value and general overall praise of Fate Zero, many were more than excited to see Euphoribol's newest adaptation of Fate and how it would deliver. Today on the agenda, and the diplomas with Fate Stay Night Unlimited Blade Works. Spoilers ahead. Animated by Euphoribol and directed by Miura Takehiro, Fate Stay Night is a visual novel adaptation of the same name created by Type Moon. Fate Stay Night of course being a direct sequel to the aforementioned Fate Zero, many people wondered how it would live up to its predecessor and were most likely disappointed by the outcome. Fate Zero being a dark and tense action thriller about the battle of clashing ideologies and nihilistic themes of how futile it is to save the world, compared to its sequel which basically goes against everything it stood for. It's not that surprising how some might have been let down. Now, I'll say this, if you entered the series expecting it to be similar to Fate Zero, you went in with the wrong mindset. Fate Stay Night is completely different down to its core. It doesn't have the cruel and punishing atmosphere of Fate Zero, nor does it have its nihilistic themes. In fact, the two can be basically considered different series, just very loosely connected. Now knowing this, do I think Fate Stay Night Unlimited Blade Works is a terrible show? No, I don't even think it's bad. If I did, I wouldn't have bought the limited edition Blu-ray. Fate Stay Night has many moments where it shines through with its high-octane adrenaline rush in action scenes. It's almost impossible to take your eyes off screen by how much of a visual spectacle it is, and paired with the well-choreographed action scenes and a soundtrack with grand theatrical scale, it's hard not to get excited when watching. Euphotable have indeed shown us their prowess in visual presentation, whether it be their great use of lighting to create a depth of field or gorgeously detailed backgrounds. With such technical proficiency, you're treated with scenes like this. Of course, let's not forget about its epic soundtrack composed by Hideyuki Fukasawa, who has only really done a handful of shows, but that doesn't stop him from creating scores that empower the scenes they're in, giving it either an intense battle epic, or a peaceful yet somber score that reflects characters' personal dilemma. Even if you don't like Fate Stay Night, there's no denying how great the soundtrack or production quality is. However, with that being said, there are still a plethora of irritable problems I have with this series, one of them being its internal consistency. Throughout the show, Fate Stay Night tries to balance a heavy-handed survival death battle with of essentially a generic high school life, and to no one's surprise, it feels absurdly jarring. It fails to juggle this dynamic and makes scenes that were meant to be taken seriously much less meaningful. The transition in tone is so poorly handled that at times it feels like you're watching a comedic slice of life, which is not to its credit. Episode 12 proves this where Rin, Saber, and Shiro all go out on a date but then later get ambushed by Caster. The shift in tone is so drastic then rather than trying to enjoy the show for what it is, I end up thinking how much better the show could have been if they executed it properly. Or or better yet, gotten rid of it. This problem isn't just a one-time fault that occurs in one episode, but prominently displays itself for the majority of the show. Part of the issue inherently stems from Fate Stay Night being an adaptation since it was fundamentally written this way, but I think the show's direction could have easily made it more than bearable. It's not like the show was incapable of doing this since there are moments such as episode 11 where Rin's and Shiro's conversation feels more as an intimate character bond served to develop their relationship rather than a slapstick slice of life. However, more often than not, the switch between tones is ineptly handled and this is most likely due to Miura Takehiro's inexperience in directing. This makes sense because before Unlimited Blade Works, the only other series he has directed was the sixth Karno Kyokai film, which I think was one of the worst in the franchise. It wasn't necessarily a bad film, but compared to the fifth installment, Paradox Spiral, or even the first, Overlooking View, Oblivion recording is awfully out of place due to its almost uplifting tone. Takahiro has a glaring weakness when it comes to alternating tone in a series, but while Fate Stay Night and Karno Kyokai 6 share the same problem, Fate is much less noticeable since it's not trying to be an eerie murder mystery with heavy-handed dialogue. Though aside from Takahiro's inexperience comes a far more annoying problem, which is Emi Ashiro. While it's true that his character is far better written than his Dean counterpart, I can't say his actions are any less aggravating. Here's why. 
The first episode of Fate Stay Night initially introduces Shiro as a naive and oblivious character who is at the wrong place at the wrong time, and due to this is killed almost twice thanks to Lancer. After summoning Saber and fending off Lancer, Shiro activates a command seal unintentionally in order to stop Saber striking Rin. The first episode serves as a decent setup to Shiro's persona, showing us how inexperienced and ignorant he is to his whole situation, and is even punished for his careless behavior. There was an actual sense of danger within the episode and even presented consequences to actions. However, my gripe is that he never changes his attitude through the course of the series and because of this acts in the most idiotic of ways. At episode 4, Shiro decides for whatever stupid reason to attend school without Saber as if it's no big deal. Not only are his actions stupid since Ryder almost kills him, but this released a sense of danger that was initially present in the earlier episodes making consequences much less impactful. His stubbornness and lack of urgency really makes for some facepalm worthy moments. Shiro is either captured or cornered various times in the show and it's mind boggling how many times he manages to escape death. Such examples include episode 4 where Ryder has him cornered in the forest but doesn't kill him for whatever reason even though the initial intent was there, episode 6 where Kasa literally just abducts him from his sleep, and episode 7 where Archer just outright betrays Shiro after saving him. You would think that after the umpteenth time, Shiro would be smart enough to be more cautious, but nope, the fucker just goes back to school in the next episode and you literally just wanna go, I said fuck you and your eyebrows! <laughs> Shiro is one of the most blandest self-insert shonen protagonists whose only real motivation is that he doesn't want anyone to die. He literally makes the show almost unwatchable at points because of his pure aggravating idiocy at pivotal moments in the story. While Shiro might be one of the most enraging characters from the show, Fate Stain has a slew of characters that it poorly develops if they even receive any at all. Characters such as Ryder where she has a solid 5 minutes of screen time and then dies off screen, Berserker who is literally just a brainless monster, and Assassin. What the fuck did he do again? Maybe criticizing these particular characters is being too nitpicky since they weren't that important. Fair enough. Although even the characters they do choose to focus on aren't nearly given enough substance for them to develop much less care for them. Episode 14 gave a backstory of how Caster came to be summoned and it did give some insight as to what her goals were, though later during her defeat it's not utilized in any significant way other than to maybe make a somewhat sentimental farewell to her master. But even then, her departure was lacking any of the emotional value inferred during the scene. This also applies to Alias' death as it showed us her bond with Berserker in an attempt to make us care, but her relationship with Berserker was treated so superficially that I didn't actually care when she died. Fate Stay Night has a tendency to sideline characters when they're not needed only to bring them back during crucial plot elements. Lancer was basically forgotten after the initial episodes and only came back when Rin and Shiro were in trouble, making the story progression feel so forced and unnatural. Though I think what's most disappointing is how the show handles character departures. They either feel very underwhelming and like lost at points are just plain stupid. Saber, one of the main heroines, is heavily underutilized. While she does retain her stature as a noble independent knight with a chivalrous code, her motives and beliefs aren't nearly as fleshed out as they could have been. Instead, we're just left with her looking badass during fight scenes with the occasional glimpses into her ideals but in all honesty is lagging any real depth. Her farewell was especially disappointing considering how important her role was. They built up her character and the relationship she had with Shiro only to have her fade away after saving Rin, making her departure feel so dull and unsentimental. Lancer's death in particular was comically stupid and was one of the worst character deaths I've seen in a while. He literally got up after being told to commit suicide not once but twice. He kills Kirei the first time and stops Mato from attempting to rape Rin the second time. Even if you argued that the scene was adapted exactly how it was in the visual novel, it doesn't stop the scene from being a giant fuck you to the audience. I could go on, but I think you get the point. For a two curse series, Fate Stay Night is extremely condensed for the amount of material it has, but yet I feel it likes to prolong events for no good reason. Many fight scenes in the show almost feel pointless at times and are essentially filler since nothing actually gets accomplished. Episode 7 was an engaging battle between Archer and Caster, but after defeating her and given the chance, Archer doesn't finish off Caster. I guess because he wasn't ordered to, but that would be a stupid reason considering this is a death battle. Episode 10 also did something similar similar where Kazuki basically took on Rin, Saber, and Shiro all by himself and still had the upper hand, though instead of finishing them off, he decides to withdraw for no real reason. These filler fights break the immersion and believability of scenes, making the show less of a coherent flowing narrative but more as a tedious contrived story that progresses when it needs to. This also brings me to the ending which felt way too convenient in solving most of their problems and was almost a cheap way to forge a happy ending. I mean Rin chooses to save Mato for some reason even though he tried to kill her multiple times, Shiro somehow manages to defeat Gilgamesh in a one-on-one -on -one battle. I understand the concept but how he did it was completely absurd and felt like the shonen power of friendship bullshit. Just take a look at this.
Not even Saber could deflect that many swords, and Shiro makes it look like child's play. Shiro ends up defeating him. Archer has one final reunion with Rin, even though Gilgamesh killed him in episode 21. It doesn't even try to attempt an explanation, and everyone basically has a happy end. What an anticlimactic ending. Everything is just solved so conveniently, and the last episode is just Fate Stay Night Slice of Life edition. It's such a shame, really. Fate Stay Night had the potential to become great, but unfortunately piles up so many little faults that in the end make it noticeably messy in its execution. The sad part is, I didn't even cover every single fault that I had in mind because I thought it would take too long, so here's a quick montage of the things I didn't get to cover. Visual spectacle and presentation is what Fate Saint Night truly excels in, and while I can't deny the show does look spectacular, I can't help but think what the show could have been if it wasn't so choppy in its execution. Fate Saint Night has some truly exciting moments, but those moments are so few and are only further watered down by its most noticeable mistakes. Keep in mind that this video mostly tackles its problems, I barely covered any of its good parts and only glossed over them. I still don't think it's a bad show. Why? Because Rin is in it. She alone makes the show worth your time. Rin is just so... Perfect. So my final verdict for Fate Stay Night is, it's alright, I guess. See you guys next time. Oh, and Han Solo dies.